I love that. I'm starting to want to get more into it. If I could figure out how to do some stuff like that, I got to start learning how to pick. I need to learn notes and all that.
All right. Hey, good evening, folks. Uh, some of you are <coughs> already logged on with us. Some of you will be joining us in a little bit. I'm going to give a little bit of time for more to log on with us. I hope everyone's having a, a good week this week, and I um, hope everybody's doing well. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, take the time to share this video if you're on Facebook, and hopefully we'll get some folks logging on to uh, join us tonight uh, through this study that we're doing. I hope that you're enjoying this study. Um, it's been a blessing to me, and uh, and uh, got, got a lot of ground to cover tonight, so we'll try to get going here pretty quickly. Uh, but again, we'll take a minute or two, and if you have, while we're waiting, if you have a prayer need, of course, we are praying for everyone in the path of the hurricane. A lot of folks in Florida um, are just uh, dealing with a lot of things right now, and so um, <clears throat> continue to pray for all of those folks, um, and praying for any and all who have been dealing with sickness or difficulty, and uh, still doing that. Um, and uh, Cheryl, I see that. Good to see you, by the way. And if you're watching and you don't mind letting us know you're with us, uh, let us know. Linda, good to see you. Um, you and Jim, good to see you all. Um, if you're listening by way of phone tonight, uh, we can't see you, but uh, thanks for joining in. All right. Uh, again, we'll give it a minute or two. If you have a prayer need that you'd like us to pray for, we'll pray in just a minute. Um, put that in the comments. If you have uh, uh, a song you'd like to hear, I'm going to sing in just a second. And so uh, you can put that in the comments as well. Um, um, we'll make some announcements at the end, but we'll go ahead and, and uh, for those of you on here, we'll, we'll um, talk about Sunday. We'll be back out uh, live Sunday in person. So I hope you'll join us Sunday morning. Um, it's supposed to be a little cooler this weekend, Jake, so you guys be ready to bundle up. Uh, but we'll still have a great time Sunday morning uh, worshiping together outside. We've had two great weeks so far, and all of you who have been able to come, we certainly do appreciate that. Thank you so much for um, making your way over here to worship with us together as we gather. We've gathered outside uh, in the in the open air. It's actually been pretty awesome. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, to be able to um, worship the Lord and then be interrupted by the birds singing, that's been pretty awesome. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for joining us from Vermont. Thank you so much. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. So I wonder if this is on, this is on purpose. We've got this clock. I just noticed this clock right over my shoulder right here. So everybody can see it. Like it's is it right? It's a little bit fat. It's a little bit fast. Okay. All right. So nobody be, you know, putting the putting the time down on the, telling me to hurry it up with the clock. I can see it. Okay. I'm just teasing. Went a little bit long last week, but I think you'll enjoy uh, the lesson this week. Um, Nancy, good to see you. And. Uh, Thank you for joining and with your dogs. Thank you for coming on. Uh, those of you who've probably, if you follow me on Facebook, you've seen we have a new member of the household. Uh, we have uh, adopted a full-blooded Great Dane, and uh, he is awesome. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful dog. He's already, he's, he's nine weeks old. His weigh-in is today, so I imagine he's going to be about, I can't remember if he was 28 pounds last week. He's, he's large already. Uh, so uh, we love him. His name is Zeus. The reason his name is Zeus is he has a streak of, he's a black dog mainly, but he has white on his face. He has this streak of white going across the top of his head that looks like a bolt of lightning. So they named him Zeus, and we, we kept the name. Uh, so his name is Zeus. We call him Zeus the Moose. And so if you don't follow me on Facebook, friend request me. I'll accept that. We can, you can check out pictures of Zeus, um, newest member of our family. We have two other dogs, by the way. We have Bailey, who is a schnauzer. She's 12. She's an old girl. And then we have Jackson, who's, who's, who's my buddy. He's my little buddy. He's our three-year-old uh, Dachshund hound mix. And 
He is, uh, he's my guy. So there's our dog family. And uh, anyway, all right, let's sing a song or two. <clears throat> and uh, if you have a song you want to hear, Josh, good to see you, man. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> logging on, man. Faithful every week. You're my, you're my, uh, you're the guy that bounces stuff back and forth at me, and I appreciate that very much. Hope you guys are having a great week um, as well. Donna, good to see you. Yeah, I know the clock's been there. That's the first time I've noticed it. Is that a new clock? It's been there forever, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been there forever. It's silly me. Oh, here we go. Uh, this is not a new song. <clears throat> I don't even know if I can do the whole thing because I'm just kind of learning it. But uh, songs, you know, I'll I'll try to f- listen to uh, some artists that I haven't listened to in a while while I'm mowing. And so this happened on Saturday or or Sunday. Uh, I caught this song, and then it just has been on repeat. And um, so it's called, Is He Worthy? And uh, it's by Chris Tomlin, but it's also written by Andrew Peterson. I believe he's written. So I'm going to try to give a little bit of it just because, man, <coughs> this song is kingdom language right here. <clears throat> do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. (laughs) Is all creation groaning? It is Is a new creation coming It is Is the glory of the Lord to be The light within our midst It is Is it good that we remind ourselves of this It is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the lion of Judah conquered the grave he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slain is he worthy Of our blessing and honor and glory, is He worthy of this? <clears throat> oh, He is. <clears throat> Does the Father? truly love us he does does the spirit move among us he does and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves he does I love this Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Yes, He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah conquered the grave he is David's root the lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe 
every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom of priests to God, to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy of Yes. Is he worthy? He is. He is. Praise his name. Man, I hope that your heart was just uh, blessed right there. Uh, my heart is overwhelmed at that song right there. Uh, so you probably, you guys are going to hear this probably again this weekend. Uh, I'm always, I always do this. I always ruin, not ruin. I, spoil the, I can't wait to get to Sunday, so I sing them on Wednesday. Um, uh, should I sing a little bit of this other one too? You think so? This one's awesome. Uh, see if I can remember it. All right, you guys, uh, everybody good? You guys let me know if you're okay. Uh, so far, Facebook, man, Facebook's been beating YouTube on Wednesday nights. That's different. Um, this song is, uh, man. Who sent this to me? Caleb? Let's see if I can remember <clears throat> how this goes. Blessed, blessed are the ones who do not bear all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary Pouring like a sky of fallen stars. Blessed are the wounded ones in mourning. Brave enough to show the Lord their scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden. Open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Blessed are the ones who walk in kindness, even in the face of great abuse. Blessed are the deeds that go unnoticed, serving with unguarded gratitude. Blessed are the ones who fight for justice, longing for the coming day of peace, the day of the Lord. Blessed is the soul that thirsts for righteousness, welcoming the last of all. Blessed are the ones who 
suffer violence and still have the strength to love their enemy. Blessed is the faith of those who persevere. Though they fall, they'll never know defeat. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. on him the kingdom is yours the kingdom is yours hold on a little more this is not the end hope is in the Lord keep your eyes on him hold on a little this is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. Yeah. Amen. That's a good one, too. Praise the Lord. Love that. Love that song. Uh, man, no requests so far. Guys are gonna just let me handle it tonight. Um, great to see. I say I always say great to see you. Great to see you on here with me. Thank you so much. I don't take that for granted. <clears throat> really, really appreciate everyone uh, hanging with us tonight. Um, yeah. Okay. Jake has a request, so we'll do it. Let me go get it. Here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heaven. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father. All right, Josh, here we go. I'm going to use my. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the pick. Here we go. See if I can do it. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. There we go. I'll fly away. All right. Hey, um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and dive in tonight. Hope you got your Bibles. Uh, we're going we're gonna to hit a lot of Scripture tonight. I hope that you are okay with that. That's what we're here to do, right? Bible study. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, again, thankful that you're here joining with me. I've got about 15 or so. That's good. And... Uh, We've been, uh, man, this is the fourth week now we have been talking about the day of the Lord. This phrase in the Bible that many, um, I don't want to say they confuse, it's probably what they've been taught, that it's all about the end, the end, the end times. You hear this phrase, most of which is used in the prophets, and we're going to push towards that tonight. <clears throat> I had a class in college, Old Testament prophets, OT prophets, and... I wish I just knew then what I knew now, you know. I just didn't get it. Um, um, I barely squeaked by by the skin of my teeth, too. I was like, what What does that mean? What does that mean? And I'm telling you, just uh, we're going to push towards some of that. But the, this is the first time you really find the phrase, the day of the Lord. It's, it's in the prophets. We're going to push towards that in t this week and going into next week. Um, but I'd say, I have to say the day of the Lord defined would be a day um, in the history of mankind where, where God confronts evil on a large scale um, and brings justice to people who are oppressed. Um, um, that's, it's called the day of the Lord. And we described in the very first week, um, <clears throat> if you're looking at uh, a mountaintop, if say you're looking at Mount Everest and you're looking at it from uh, a side view and the peaks are going up to the mountain, you wouldn't necessarily see all the peaks. You would just see this one big conglomerate of uh, ma meshed all together up to you see the peak. And But if you turn to the side, you would see these different peaks, the Mallory Step, you know, all this going up to the side view. And these, if this is how the prophets would, the prophets would be looking at that, the other view, that they would always be looking towards the day, the, the ultimate day of the Lord. But we, would, we see this, or the Bible would, the story of the Bible would be saying that these little peaks all along the way are also the day of the Lord. And we talked about that the prophets and the biblical writers would use the language of uh, the early on stories of the Bible, like the Exodus or the Babylon story, um, to describe uh, other things along the way in the Bible. So, um, the day of the Lord, um, the ultimate D-Day, we would say sometime, we, I think in the first week we talked about it being the capital D-Day, would be your book of Revelation, the end of human history, um, when God will once and for all uh, free 
the oppressed and take care of human evil, human evil on a grand scale. So we've been following or tracing this history. And I uh, hope you got a pen and pad out. You can write down some things. Let me review right quick. We, we traced Genesis 3 through 11. Went all the way back to Genesis 3, um, uh, culminating at the city of Babylon or the Babylon story, the Babel story actually, in Genesis 11. Then we followed the story all the way to Egypt. And, of course, we said that Babel, the story in Genesis 11, was the first time that God confronted a large group of people. Um, this tower represented um, humanity defining good and evil on its own terms and doing its best to put itself in a divine place. And God confronted that and took care of it. Um, and I think Babylon was established at that point as a motif that would be used all throughout Scripture, you'll see. And so... We traced it, and then, then the story went to Egypt. Um, images of corrupt human societies that are antagonistic to God's view of justice. Um, then we talked about Israel being rescued from slavery out of Egypt, and God calls Israel to be a nation set apart, a, a counter-Babylon, if you will, so that the world can see what God is like. And last week we talked about Abraham actually being called out of Babylon. Uh, to become this group of people as they moved into Egypt. They grew to be a large group of people. We discussed the Passover and its significance to the day of the Lord theme and how that it was described by the biblical writers of, or as the day, or as a day, um, the day of the Lord, res when God rescued his people from an oppressive regime. Um, this week, we're going to discuss Israel's transition from being the oppressed uh, to the nation that is suddenly the oppressor. Um, and we're going to talk about Solomon. Um, but before we do that, here's a recap kind of, again, the, going back to the Tower of Babel. A civilization was driven to define good and evil for itself and reach for a godlike status as a society. We trace the story of Israel, the family of Abraham, all the way to Egypt, where this family had multiplied to the point where Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, felt threatened by them. So much so that his solution to that problem was basically mass genocide um, and to kill all the boys. And all of a sudden, you have a nation state redefining good and evil and killing children. And, in, and not just that, but it has become the right thing to do. And so we go from the Tower of Babel, now the Egypt in the Exodus story is the New Babylon. An oppressive, powerful civilization, but God rescues Israel and we talked about the ten plagues. And um, interestingly, I'm, I'm reading a good book right now about God's mercy in the Old Testament. People think God's uh, um, unjust or whatever. I, I'm reading a book that's it's awesome. I'll have to talk about that maybe in the coming weeks when I get a better grasp of it. But we said that the ten plagues, um, in, in, in ancient society or ancient days, people would look at that and say, man, Lord... Uh, you are being so long-suffering. Um, they, would, they would look at it as God being very long-suffering because you've got a nation here who's practicing genocide. Uh, we would look at it and say, uh, Lord, what's the deal? You know, chill out. They would look at it as, actually, we would look at it as being God. Uh, they would look at it as, Lord, um, you're taking it easy on them. Um, and so God gives them, I mean, think about it, God gives Pharaoh 10 chances to repent he never does. And so then we, we talked about the story of Passover. This was memorialized now for thousands of years. Um, we, we talked about its significance leading up to Jesus in the upper room when he changed Passover fundamentally and it becoming a day of the Lord as well. And so we ended with, with the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 last week. And if you got your Bibles, we can review that. This is a great, uh, great passage. Um, Exodus 15, verse 1, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. Uh, they said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Of course, this is after they've come through the Red Sea. They're looking back, and they're praising the Lord for the victory. And verse 3 is a big verse. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. 
Verse 11, Lord, who is, who, is like, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. With your faithful love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. You will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. And then verse 17 uh, is very important. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. And then verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And so then we, we see clearly this story, albeit it's a huge part of the biblical narrative, Israel coming out of bondage, out of captivity, a beautiful picture of salvation. But we see also this story is clearly a kingdom story. And the Lord is depicted as a mighty warrior, but not a warrior as you would expect. He becomes a mighty warrior for those who are the oppressed, those who are enslaved, those who are suffering at the hands of evil. And God is taking down evil and oppression on a national or an empirical level. And the Passover in this story becomes the first day, the day. Um, this day would be memor memorialized for thousands of years. It's still to this day the day that the warrior king comes and rescues his people. It becomes, uh, we said this last week, the seed, if you will, for the idea, this day of the Lord idea that's prevalent throughout Scripture. And now Israel can move into the promised land. They can become the nation through which all the world will be blessed. And all they have to do is not become like Babylon, a nation uh, that listens to God and obeys his voice and becomes an alternate kingdom among the nations. That's what the plan is for Israel to be. A nation who follows the Torah and listens to the voice of God. They have the presence of the Lord with them. They have the tabernacle. They have a lot going for them. And so what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? That's a silly question if, you, if you've read the Old Testament, right? What could go wrong? They seemingly have a lot going for them. They have a good leader, Moses. Uh, but if you've read this, this story, you know that uh, a lot, a lot can go wrong and a lot does go wrong. Um, I, I, um, again, I want to give credit to Tim Mackey and John, the Bible Project guys. They, their study has helped me tremendously with this. And, um, so we're, we're going to have to fly through some more history pretty quick. I'm going to condense it down because the relevant point for this study, the day of the Lord theme, is well into the history of, of Israel after the Exodus story. Um, you guys hang with me. Um, so then, the book of Joshua uh, is next. Israel goes into the land. Uh, the book of conquest, God fighting for his people. Um, the land is divided among the tribes. Joshua leads the people. Of course, you know, the very beginning of that, the great story of Jericho, um, God is, is fighting on his people's behalf. Uh, in Judges, Israel ends up in these cycles of rebellion and becomes becoming slaves again. And God, of course, raises up many, many ambiguous characters, uh, the Judges, some of which you think, you know, you think, man, how's God going to use that guy or this woman or that person? And you got, you got Gideon, you got uh, Samson and... Uh, God raises up judges, but eventually, down the line, Israel becomes a kingdom in the land, and uh, King David uh, unifies the tribes into one. Things are looking pretty good, and then David, then David passes off the scene, and the United Kingdom, he passes it to one of his sons, Solomon. Solomon, uh, of course, one of the most famous kings in all of Israel's history outside of his father. And you will find his story told in 1 Kings chapter, chapters 1 through 11. And that's, we're going to focus on this a little bit tonight. And so 1 Kings 1 through 11, this is very important for this Babylon Day of the Lord theme. Solomon's story is just it's divided into three parts. It's, it's got a really promising beginning. Uh, there's this flamboyant story of success and prominence, and then there's this turning. Um, so we're going to look at this. In 1 Kings uh, 3, the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, and, and you, you should be familiar with this story, and he gives him a wish. You can have anything you want, Solomon. What will it be? 
And we're going to read verse 5, starting in verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, ask, what should I give you? And Solomon replied, you have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You've continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Verse 7, Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people you've chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. So, and here it is, give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. Pay attention to that phrase. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And what a story. You guys think about it. Comment, you could comment about this. If you could ask God for anything, if God says, I'll give you one wish, I'm going to grant you one wish, what would it be? What would it be? Solomon, you can, have, you can ask for anything. He could have asked for wealth, for victory over his enemies, anything. But what he asks for is wisdom. Wisdom. Specifically, the phrase that he uses, and pay attention, links this back to actually Genesis, the garden story in Genesis. Pay attention right to verse 9. Look back at verse 9. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge or rule your people and to discern between good and evil. Discern between good and evil. Solomon wanted to follow God's plan. In Genesis 2 and 3 are echoing here. Solomon is ruling the world as, as we would see it, as they would know it, here as God intended, and he wants to rely on God's definition of good and evil here. That's what he wants to do. He wants to do this under God's authority. I believe that he is sincere. Um, do you see it, the, the tie back? And so God gives him wisdom. <clears throat> and because Solomon was genuine in what he asked for, uh, God gives him much more. He goes ahead and he gives him wealth and honor and long life if, verse 14, if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands just as your father David did. And so here you go. God gives Solomon wisdom. Not long after this, you hear the story about the two women who come to Solomon with the dispute over the baby, and he tells the story about cutting one in half. You know, you've heard that story. You can read that on down the line. But Solomon, right off the bat, you get an illustration of his wisdom uh, in discerning, really discerning what is underneath, um, seeing life from God's point of view, a kingdom point of view. And so Solomon begins to build his kingdom. Then, <clears throat> all of a sudden, you guys follow me, the story begins to depict Solomon as, an, as this empire builder. We get a long description next of his executive staff team, and he collects insane amounts of wealth. And the more you read this story, the more uncomfortable it really gets. Because Now, I've read this, I used to read this story and think, man, God's really blessing. Look at all this and all that. Look at all this and the, but the more you read this, if you understand what's going on, the more uncomfortable it really should get because what you start to see is that, is this, that this kingdom that Solomon is building starts to look a lot like what Egypt looked like. For example, in chapter 5, and we're still in 1 Kings, verse 13, then King Solomon, verse 13 of chapter 5, then King Solomon drafted forced laborers from all Israel. The labor force numbered 32,000 men. Really? Think about that. He sent 10,000 to Lebanon up north each month in shifts. One month they were in Lebanon, two months they were at home. Solomon had 70,000 porters and 80,000 stone cutters in the mountains, not including his 3,000 Deputies, or that word is the same word used in Exodus for taskmasters. These guys were in charge of the work. 
They supervised the people doing the work. The king, verse 17, commended them to, uh, uh, to quarry large, costly stones to lay the foundation of the temple with dressed stones. <laughs> and if you read the, Jake's phone just went rogue. And if you read this on the surface, you're like, man, that's awesome. Wow. Huh. But interpret or think what you will. This sure looks like Solomon is now using forced labor with taskmasters to build God's kingdom or God's temple, excuse me. He's building a kingdom the exact same way that Pharaoh was building. You could suppose now that Solomon is is treating these forced laborers well. You could suppose that. We don't know, but it's ambiguous. But the narrator here in in this story starts telling you these stories about Solomon that, that if you think about it, start to remind you of Egypt. And in Egypt, it was clearly bad. So then, is this good here, what Solomon's doing, or is it bad? <laughs> you got I mean, it's bad. You got to read on, though. Again, you, you, I think you see the brilliance of the biblical writers here. This ties in. Solomon is being described as what Pharaoh was. So then with these thousands of slave laborers, think about this, stay with me. Okay? Solomon spends seven years building the temple. And uh, the writer here in Kings takes two chapters, and wow, these detailed work during these seven years. It's amazing. Take time to read it. It is unbelievable. Um, you can read about that in chapters 5 and 6. I did that today. It, it was an impressive structure, to say the least, the temple. But what I want you to see in the very next chapter, chapter 7, and the first verse, it tells us that Solomon then spent 13 years completing his palace. <laughs> did you see? He, he spent seven years building God's temple. That's great. But then he turns around and he spends almost double that. He spends seven years on the Lord's dwelling place. And you think that's good. But then he turns around and spends nearly 14 years on his own dwelling place. And then the story continues to even get more suspicious. If you look at chapter 7 and verse 8, Solomon's own palace where he would live in the other courtyard behind the hall was of similar construction, and he made a house like this hall for who? Who, Jake? Are you watching that? Are you seeing that? Chapter 7, verse 8. Pharaoh's daughter. To Pharaoh's daughter. He made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, and not just that, his wife. His wife. And so, and then the story gets even crazier. To pay the bride price, the dowry, for giving his daughter, look at chapter 9, verse 16. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, attacked and captured Gezer, this city. He then burned it, killed the Canaanites who lived in the city, gave it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. And so now, Solomon is like in a political marriage. <laughs> He's, the bride price is the life of all these people who were just burned in this city. And man, I'm just thinking, what is going on with this guy? What is going on here? He just built the temple, yes, but then he builds himself a mansion twice as awesome as the temple, and then he's taking blood money as a dowry for his new wife. Oh, who just happens to be the daughter of Pharaoh of Egypt. Now, He's not supposed to marry foreign women. That's a part of the deal. And he's already gone astray in this particular area, much less the king of Egypt's daughter. And so the biblical writer's winking here, wink, wink, and the, and the king of Egypt does this to the people in Gezer, the same thing that Pharaoh did to the children of Israel when they were in exile some 500 years earlier before. So this is tying in. Now Israel is benefiting from the same type of activity. And then it gets even more interesting. In chapter 10, we're told that the number of his annual import of gold 
Everybody still with me? The number of Solomon's annual import of gold per year is 666 talents. Now, I know some of you are like, wait, 666? Uh, that's 58 to 75 pounds of weight a talent. I don't know what to make of the 666. I, I'm not going to dig into that. But basically, Solomon is having imported some 50,000 pounds of gold per year. Come on, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Much, much less in an ancient world. And what Solomon, or what does Solomon do? Now, okay, so he's having all this gold imported. You think, well, he's going to build, he's going to do some good for some people and maybe make. What does he do with all this? Well, chapter 10, verse 16. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. Uh, pounds of 15 pounds of gold went into each shield. He made 300 small shields of hammered gold. Nearly four pounds of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. He just puts them in his house. He has some shields he wants as decorations. Then check this out. The king also made a large ivory throne and overlaid it with fine gold. The throne had six steps. There was a rounded top at the back of the throne, armrest on either side of the seat, Two lions standing beside the armrest. These, these structured, these carved out lions. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps. One at each end. Nothing like it. Listen, the Bible says nothing like it had ever been made in any other kingdom. He has an army of 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. And guess where the horses come from? All of his horses. From Egypt. Once every three years, a ship would arrive from Tarshish bearing gold, silver, silver, ivory, interestingly, apes, <laughs> and peacocks. That's what the writer tells us. And it says that the king, Solomon, made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. He made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean hills. What is going on with Solomon? What is going on? Where does my head have to be to design all of this stuff for myself? Remember, this was the guy who said, Lord, just give me discernment to know what is good and evil. I just want wisdom. Now, he's like gone crazy. Can you see what's happening to Solomon? Yes, he asked the Lord for wisdom, but now the wealth and the power are doing something to him. He has allowed pride, wealth, and power to begin to corrupt him. And I forget who says the quote, but the quote is, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Why are we being told all this information? Well, it's in the inspired word of God. But I think most people would think because would think because, man, Solomon asked for wisdom, and wow, look at all this awesome, all these awesome things that he's doing and accomplishing with that wisdom. He's building, he's building a Tesla or a Lexus of an empire. But if you follow this closely, the slaves, the people of Gezer, um, we got to look back at Deuteronomy 17, actually, starting in verse 14. We got to look back there. Um, you're going to see the narrator deliberately connecting the two passages. Moses addressing Israel for how they are to live in the promised land when they get there. All of this description of Solomon is for a reason. When you look back at Deuteronomy 17, listen to what it says in verse 14. Follow closely. When you enter the land, the Lord your God has given you. Take possession of it live in it and say, I will set a king over me like the nations all around me. You are to appoint over you the king the Lord God chooses. So they did good there. Appoint a king from your brothers. You're not to set a foreigner over you or one who's not of your people. They did good there. Verse 16, however, he must not acquire many horses for himself <laughs> or send the people back to Egypt. Where did his horses come from? They came from Egypt. Don't send the people back to acquire many horses. For the Lord has told you, you are never to go back that way again. Now, again, you think horses, chariots, back in the day, 
This was military might. Horses, chariots, shields, all of it. Right? And verse 17. He must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver. This is Moses is telling him, this is the law. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. And by the way, all of this is what ancient Near Eastern kings do. But look at verse 18. Here's what Israel's kings are supposed to do. Tim Mackey says they're supposed to be Bible nerds. (laughs) They're supposed to be Bible nerds. Verse 18, when he is seated on his royal throne, he is to write a copy of this instruction, the Pentateuch, the Torah for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. He is supposed to write it out himself. It is to remain with him, and he is to read it or read from it all the days of his life. Every day he's supposed to read it so that he may learn to fear the Lord God, to observe all the words of this instruction, and to do these statutes. And by the way, this is what his father David told him to do on his deathbed. Verse 20, then his heart will not be exalted above his countrymen. He will not turn from this command to the right or the left, and he and his sons will continue reigning for many years in Israel. 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8, King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite women. From the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. They must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines. And here's the phrase. I know we could, we could talk for a while about that. That's amazing. Not amazing. Horrifying. I mean... That's bad. Here's the phrase. And they turned his heart away. They turned his heart away. 700 wives. I think that would fall into the category of many that Moses said that a king should not have. (laughs) Right? Um, When Solomon was old, the scripture says, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. Imagine this. Imagine this. You ask the the God of your ancestors, Jehovah God, for wisdom. He gives it to you. And now, such a tragic story. His wives in his life have turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. Verse 7 in 1 Kings 11. At that time, listen to this, Solomon built a high place. Think about the high place. We talked about this last week and. The week before, the Tower of Babel story, the high place. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites, on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their gods. And so Solomon's story ends tragically. We're about to wrap this up. Everybody hang with me. Solomon's story ends tragically with his enemies raiding and taking away different parts of the kingdom and his downfall ends in a near civil war, a split of the kingdom. If you read your Bible, you'll see this progression. And then all the tribes eventually get picked off for the next 250 years until Babylon takes them out into captivity. So this story, this story is about, and don't miss this, the oppressed had become the oppressor. The people that God had liberated from Egypt slash Babylon had actually become now Babylon themselves. We see the journey of pride and self-exaltation here. You don't just wake up one day and you are Pharaoh. (laughs) It's a slow fade. For Solomon, he started out really well and he wanted to do the right thing. And in the building of his own kingdom, something turns. 
He's subtly building, he's subtly building Babylon, and then all of a sudden, things that were once evil become good. And here it is, the building of a new Babylon, tragically here in Jerusalem. So then, um, Solomon's story ends, and we move into the part of the story where the prophets start depicting the downfall of Israel. Now, here's where we get into, this is where, and this is where the day of the Lord appears as a phrase in the story. But it's the prophets, the prophets talking about the downfall of Israel, because it has now become the new Egypt. See, after Solomon, if you think like a play, play, a play is going on, a group of people enter the stage that we really haven't seen before, and they are the prophets. And at this point in history, now after Solomon, we have the tribes divided north and south. So, so next week, we're going to talk about a guy named Amos. Amos was a, was a farmer. Amos the farmer. That's who we're going to talk about next week. Now, um, I guess a, all, a takeaway we could all, something we could all take away this week is this. Uh, Josh, you're right. Knowing the difference doesn't mean he chooses correctly. It's correct. Um, I think that we can look at the life of Solomon and see. Well, I, I just I've got the phrase pulled up here. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You know, I don't know any of us who, are, who have such power, but we know that the obsession with wealth and power and uh, our own, if left to our own vices can take us down a path of destruction. And what will happen is before you know it, before you even realize it, like everybody else around you realizes it, except for you. Like I imagine there were people in the kingdom going, what's up with Solomon? He's enslaving his own people. The prophets were, were all over it, but, but Solomon was on this downward spiral, just like Genesis 3 to 11, we said, was a downward spiral of humanity going into this. There goes Solomon. And so almost Solomon's personal life is a picture of those first several chapters of Genesis. This, they have a parallel picture. His life. He had gotten to the point uh, of exalting himself to a de- divine status, worshiping other gods, building high places. Man, this was a guy that had seen and actually had conversation with the Lord. So I want to challenge you this week uh, to stay true. Sunday we brought a message called, uh, well, we were talking about the Shema prayer. I asked the question, where does your allegiance lie? We talked about our allegiance being to the God who loves us. And so let's stay in the word. Let's stay focused. Let's not allow ourselves to take control. Let's give God control and give him all the glory. So next week, we're going to dig into the prophets a little more. We're going to see where this phrase, the day of the Lord, actually is makes its first appearance, other than we did talk about Passover being called the day. We're going to see next week the actual day of the Lord phrase. And so hope you'll hang with me. Uh, the story of Solomon. It's crazy. Crazy story. It's a sad one, for sure. But uh, we're grateful for the King of Kings. Amen? He will never fail us, and we're grateful for that. All right, uh, I'm going to pray. Thank you guys for joining me tonight. And uh, if you've got a prayer need, uh, you can uh, list it in the comments. Some of you already have, and I'll go back and check those. I really appreciate everyone joining me tonight, and I uh, hope that you'll share this, uh, that others will join us in the future. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for our time in the Word, just this really study of Old Testament and Bible history uh, as we'll, we'll make our way through and um, talking about the day of the Lord. Um, Lord, we thank you, God, that you are in the business of making things new, that one day you will come and make all things right. And, Lord, we are longing for that day when your return uh, will happen. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for these stories that we can glean from, learn from, read about. 
And uh, we pray that we would all remain faithful in these difficult days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Josh just got that, so I'll, I'll pray. And we'll pray in the morning, too, in our Bible study. All right, love you all. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, let me know. Send me an email. Give me a call. If you, um, uh, if you need anything, make sure you let us know, and uh, we'll keep you up to date. Don't, don't forget, this Sunday we'll be outside again. Um, you probably have to wear a sweatshirt or a hoodie or something, but uh, we'll worship the Lord. It'll be awesome. God, uh, God bless you. Love you. We'll see you next time.